So, well, we can't really promise any uh, James Bond villains misusing inhalers this afternoon. However, hopefully we will promise you four really interesting and insightful presentations based on technology innovations. We also know that we are standing between you and the drinks reception, and I suspect nobody really wants to miss that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Yorick, who's going to present our first speaker today. Hello, everybody. Um, so the first speaker uh, is pronounced like Wilbert de Kruijf, learn this one for the next time, um, is not only acknowledging the National Christmas Jumper Day today, uh, but it's also General Manager and Chief Technology Officer at Resica. Um, he's developing novel syringe-based soft mist inhalers uh, based on the med spray microspray nozzles. Before founding Resica in January 21, uh, Wilbert has been working at med spray. Um, he has uh, transitioned from a product designer and an engineer into a business developer and aerosol scientist with a specialization in nebulizer and soft mist inhalers. Um, he will speak today on what happened to nebulizer innovation. Wilbur. Thank you very much. Um, I, would, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for asking me for this. So they, they said, we want to talk, we want to know what happened to nebulizer innovation. And um, I said yes very quickly, and then I realized, okay, what actually happened the last five years in nebulizer innovation. And I, I asked around and I found a few things. I hope I will surprise you with what I found. Um, in order to do that, uh, I first want to explain to you how nebulizers work in um, a very simple manner. So I'm here at my own title, not on behalf of my company or my company's affiliate. Um, and I, I want to tell you about nebulization principles. So nebulizers can be based on either a flow of just water, or they can be based on a flow of gas, most of the times air, and then water. And um, I'm, I'm going to disappoint a few people today, because I will limit myself to the most common nebulizer types. So I, I won't tell you about electrohydrodynamic spray, which is really interesting, but you can ask the people from Gilbert Technologies. And I, I, I don't talk about the, uh, the newest Swedish U-Mist uh, type of making uh, an, an, an nebulizer, but I, I will focus on the, on the main ones. So what could people already do during Roman times? And if you take two straws and you put one in a glass of water and you put the other one against it, and you blow, you, you generate an underpressure which sucks up the water. And then you can spray, and then you have a, a two-phase flow. So you have an airflow that drags liquid. And um, this is uh, how the first yeah, bulb sprayers were made. So they were used for perfume in the 18th century and the 19th century, and they were also used for the first types of nebulizer uh, bulb sprayers in, in the 19th century. Um, and the jet nebulizer, it works very similar. So a jet nebulizer has an airstream, and it gets through a venturi where it, where it goes faster, and then it draws, it, so it has an under pressure which draws in liquid. So it mixes liquid with air and it sprays it. And the thing with a jet nebulizer, is that it generates a broad array of particles and the biggest droplets you don't want. And that's why most nebulizers, jet nebulizers, have a baffling system. So it's a kind of labyrinth where the small droplets can move through and the big droplets, they will hit that baffle and then they normally drop back into the liquid. And then they can be nebulized again. So it could be that if you use a jet nebulizer, that your formulation is nebulized multiple times before it actually is available for inhalation. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, uh, there's lots of companies making jet nebulizers and they're still being used uh, for, for several applications. Um, 
If you take a water tap and you put it open just a little, you, you get dripping or drops. And if you put it just a little harder, you get a phenomenon which is called Rayleigh breakup. And in, <clears throat> in Rayleigh breakup, the droplets are two times the size of the hole. And in a tap, this is difficult because you really have to find the range where this happens. Because if you open it more, you get yeah, more like a, like a stream. And if you would open it much more, you would get a, what we call full atomization. And if you look into full atomization, that's also a quite broad array of droplets. To make full atomization, you need uh, very big pressures. So it's used in diesel cars, so to, to make the, 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 the fuel sprayed and atomized, but they use 200, 300, 500 bar. Um, there's, there's one inhaler, in a prototype from the Respimat, in the beginning that used full atomization. So they made a nozzle and they took a tin foil and they pierced it with a needle so it had nice rough uh, rims and then they put a lot of pressure on it and they got full atomization. But later on they changed that to a different principle. So talking about single phase flows, so to make with a liquid alone a droplet pattern is a little bit like garden sprays. And on this garden spray that I made, um, you can see four different nozzles. So you can have a flat plane with just holes in it, then you get jets and they can be Rayleigh breakups, so they break up into droplets. You can also make a dome, and then in the dome you can make holes, you get a kind of a shower spray, so the, the spray is not going ahead, but it, it's nicely diverging. Uh, you can also, if you have a dome, you can put a slit in, and then from the slit you get a kind of fan. And this fan expands, and then at the rims it also breaks up in droplets. So that's a, a fan spray. I, I've never seen an inhaler based on a fan spray, so if you want to start a new company, you can uh, try this nozzle. Uh, the, the last one is the, the, the impinging jet nozzle. That's the principle that's behind the recipe mat. I'll, I'll explain that later. So if we look at single phase flow nozzles, then the, the MET spray nozzles with which uh, I've been working the last 15 years, it's a plate made out of silicon with very small holes in them in a thin membrane and you push liquid through and you get these Rayleigh jets and they break up in droplets. So if you make two micron holes, you get four micron droplets. Um, normally a nozzle like this has like 100 holes to get sufficient flow rate for getting your medication through. If you look at the Respimat device from Boehringer, it's uh, following the Savar principle. So you have two jets, they collide. Where they collide, they form a kind of pancake, and the pancake will break up at the, drop, at the sides in droplets. And um, so, so Boehringer made a mini garden sprayer out of silicon where in the silicon they made these channels and the channels are 8 by 8 micron and 40 micron long approximately and they, they collide under an angle of 90 degrees and they cover that with a glass plate. So you have a wafer with lots of these nozzles on it out of silicon, you cover it with a glass plate and then you dice them into little pieces and you have what, what they call a uniblock. And there are now also other uh, competitors coming for the recipe mat who are using the same type of nozzles. Um, another type of nebulizers is uh, that you have a plate with holes in it, but you let that plate or a horn in the liquid or something, you let it vibrate. And what happens then is that if you vibrate from every hole, you will get a droplet. So it's a real droplet generator. And this is, at the moment, the most used uh, nebulizer for drug device combinations. And I, that's something that I forgot to say when I started. So nebulizers are widely used in hospitals. And sometimes they're used to keep people busy, like my grandmother, because it takes like half an hour. They get nice and quiet. They get some salbutamol in. And, uh, 
So it, it has other aspects than just uh, delivering the drug. But there, I'm focusing in my talk mostly on drug device combinations, so that you have a drug with some type of nebulization, and that together is put, is put on the market. Um, and that's also why I, I, I don't talk about innovations in those other types of nebulizers, uh, which are also nice, but I had to re restrict myself. So these vibrating mesh nebulizers, so uh, there's uh, Aerogen does this for hospitals and, and Philips uses the Aerogen meshes for, for uh, home use. Um, Pari has uh, nebulizers with vibrating meshes, uh, the E-flow types. And um, for instance, uh, HCMED is also an upcoming player in, in, this, uh, in this field. And there are several, several others. Um, the details of the mesh matter. So th there are different meshes and they are made in different ways. So for instance, the Pari E-flow mesh is made by laser drilling and the holes are round, but they are quite sharp, uh, the edges of it. And for instance, the aerogen meshes that are in, in this nebulizer, they are electroformed, which means that you, you have a kind of foil and then you grow something on that, but that is quite rounded by itself. So it's like a, yeah, a, a nickel palladium or a, a nickel uh, structure that is grown and it, it's much more round. So the, the structures are, are rounder and for that reason, for instance, the shear forces are also smaller. We will see that later. The last type of nebulizers that I, I want to, to discuss is ultrasonic nebulizers. They're not used that much anymore but in the US, there's a product on the market that, uh, for pulmonary hypertension patients that's using this. So you have a cup of liquid, and under that you have a, something that vibrates. And if you vibrate it, you, you get a kind of pillars in the, in the middle where the liquid comes up. And if you have the right frequency, you, you create a kind of fountain, and this fountain makes droplets. And um, this is in the, in the kilohertz region. Um, it's quite, it, it heats up the liquid. It, it's quite, uh, quite a lot of energy you put it in. Uh, but there is now also an, a, new, a new variant of it, which is called su surface acoustic wave. And it is more in the megahertz, and it's more affecting the, the, um, the surface of the liquid. And uh, this specific uh, company has made uh, micro wells of about 200 micron, uh, where the liquid forms uh, yeah, different jets. So every well generates a jet and they create droplets. So there's, there's four uh, different ways of, of having a nebulizer. So there's uh, jet nebulizers, you can have single phase flow based nebulizers or, or uh, soft mist inhalers, and you can have vibrating mesh and uh, ultrasonic. Um, this is how you generate the droplets. Um, now there's also a patient, and the patient is inhaling, and the patient is inhaling and exhaling. And if you, if you do that in rest, it, it's almost like a sinus, um, which this isn't, but this is the thing I could make in the airplane on the way here. And um, normally, many nebulizers nebulize the whole time. So people inhale and exhale, and during the exhalation, yeah, the, the aerosol is kind of wasted. Um, so lots of smart people in this industry, so we have breath actuated nebulizers. So there's nebulizers that only generate the aerosol during the inhalation. And then there's even smarter people who said like, oh, maybe we should just generate aerosol at the be beginning of the inhalation, because then when you inhale, you inhale aerosol, and then you inhale chase air after the aerosol, so it gets nice and deep into the lungs, and you have the maximum effect of the aerosol that you're giving. And then why should you let people only inhale tidally, like 600 milliliter per time, you can also make them inhale longer. So there's nebulizers who train and guide the people 
on how long to inhale. And um, yeah, for instance, the, uh, the Arami device or the Fox device, they, they train users to inhale quite long and they give a bolus during a certain period of that inhalation time. So I've been asked to talk about innovation in, in nebulizers and uh, I've categorized it in the following categories. So there's things that have become smaller and smarter and disposable. There's things that have been done to the gas or to the liquid. And there's, uh, <coughs> there's some really smart and new things that have been, have been done. Um, let's start with smaller. So vibrating mesh nebulizers and other nebulizers are getting smaller and smaller. So this is an example from Tulmo Tree. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a nice small vibrating mesh nebulizer, wireless on, on batteries. Um, they also get smarter. So this is an example. This is the, uh, the Vectura Fox. It's a device that has a mouthpiece, which is transparent. And there's lights in the device that show the patient whether they inhale correct or not. So if you inhale and it is green, you inhale slow enough and you do it well. If you inhale too fast, it will turn orange and red and, and start blinking. And it will also say how many inhalations you took. It's connected. So there's more and more connectivity coming in because most of the nebulizers that exist, they are electric. So you can, you can easily add patient monitoring uh, feedback to the doctor, feedback to the, to the patient. So these nebulizers get smaller, smarter and smarter. What's also happening is that uh, pharma companies like meter doses. So for instance, uh, a Respimat or a Respimat generic like this one from Merxin, they, they have a meter dose. So you wind them up, you fire them, and they give always the same dose. Um, the Arami device, which is a vibrating mesh nebulizer, it gives um, a dose which you use a dropper to give it on the membrane. So you, you, you measure how much insulin you need and then you give one, two or three drops on the mesh and then you start inhaling and you inhale that amount. So the metering is here external, so it's in the dropper and not in the device, but the, the device just nebulizers what you put in because normally in nebulizers it's a cup that you fill and then you just keep inhaling until it starts sputtering or until it's empty and these these are ways to get more a metered dose per puff or a metered dose for the for the treatment what's also happening is that um, things are getting disposable so nebulizers normally have quite expensive uh, for instance, vibrating meshes. So it, it's a new mesh is uh, 80, 100, 120 euros. Um, <clears throat> and you don't want to throw that away with every time you use medication. So you have to clean them. So the Cunovia device, for instance, it has a container which is connected to a vibrating mesh. And if you, you can use this for a certain time, let's say a week or a month, and you don't clean it in between. So you, you throw away the mesh after, after you use the container. And also uh, in, in Resica, where I work, we're working on disposable uh, nebulizers like the Pilmo spray, and we're working on uh, devices which have a glass syringe in it with a nozzle on top. And the nozzles in Resica are so small that you can, yeah, that they are so that they are cheap enough to marry them with one cartridge and then discard after every every time you use a cartridge. There is another trend which is contradicting this and which is which is kind of which you have to balance. And that is that we want less waste in our in our society. So the recipe math from Beringer Ingelheim, it came with disposable cartridges so that Normally, you, you would use one Respima device for one month. But now, for in Germany, for instance, you get one Respima device and three cartridges. So you use the device for three months. Uh, so every month, you throw away 
a cartridge, but that's much less waste than when you would throw away a complete device every month. <clears throat> another trend or another innovation that, we've, uh, that I've seen is that uh, people try to use different gases. So for instance, uh, helium, um, like Air Liquide, or a CO2. In, in this case, this is a, a product from, uh, from that Soleromet is uh, developing. And um, they, uh, their working hypothesis is that if you give patients air with 10% CO2, that this CO2 will trigger the lungs to open up further. So it's not a bronchodilator for the upper airways, but it's more to open up the lower airways, which is good for people with, with COPD or other lung diseases. So instead of feeding just air into the nebulizer, they feed air with 10% CO2 uh, in, in, the, in the nebulizer. So that's on the air side. On the, on the drug side, on the liquid side, there's also changes. So um, normally nebulizers were solutions, sometimes suspensions that you inhale, and they stay in your lung as long as the molecule is staying there. But um, uh, quite recently, uh, Insmed brought a new drug on the market, uh, amikacin, in a liposomal formulation. And this formulation takes care that, you, that the drug stays longer into the lung and that it, 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 and it works in the lung because it has to treat bacteria that are in the lung. They are treating very nasty mycobacterial non-tuberculosis-like uh, infections. And they, they had to have the antibiotic in the lung very long and to, to stay active and to get it out. It's a, it's a, it's a long and, and nasty uh, treatment that, that uh, with, with other uh, nebulizers could not be treated very well. So they, on, the, on the formulation side, they solved that by making a controlled release formulation. Something else that I'm seeing more and more is that the lung is being used as a vehicle. So you inhale something that is meant for the heart or for the systemic circulation, like, like insulin. But this is an example from a company in the US called Incarda. They are developing a flecainite inhalation, which is normally given uh, in Europe by uh, IV. But you have to, if you have a fibrillation, an atrial fibrillation of your heart, you have to go to a hospital, they have to get a doctor, he has to connect you and you have to sit half an hour on an, an, an infusion system. And with a nebulizer, you can treat them faster and you can get a, a good dose through the lungs straight into the heart uh, where you need it, where it can trigger a receptor and your heart can get in the normal rhythm again. So it's a complete different way of thinking than asthma or CPD, local treatments in the lung. It's a systemic way. And um, one really surprising innovation in, 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 uh, in, in nebulizers is that uh, Cancino Bio in China, they've brought an inhaled vaccine booster on the market for COVID. And uh, Aerogen has made the, the device for this. And the speaker after me, Ronan, uh, uh, is one of the inventors of this device. And I compare it with a coffee machine. So it's like a coffee machine, it has a nebulizer, and the nebulizer nebulizes the vaccin into a paper cup. And when the patient is up, he gets a paper cup with a lid on it, and the lid has a little mouthpiece. And the paper cup is a kind of spacer. So you inhale from the spacer, and you get your COVID vaccination booster in the lungs where it needs to work and where it gives a longer and better protection. They could save um, four-fifths of the medication, so they need only one-fifth of the medication to get the same uh, immuno response as from, as from five times the amount in, a, in an intramuscular injection. Okay. Now I get to a, a quote of, uh, of Merxin, uh, which in their latest uh, mailing said, yeah, Nebulizers in 2023, they're really out of date. They're like fax machines, they're obsolete. And uh, I, don't, I don't agree with that. So uh, 
I, I, I think that nebulizers will be essential. And I think that nebulizer innovation in the next five years will be around nebulizing biologics. And biologics like mRNA, they require higher doses than micrograms. They need milligrams. Um, they also, <coughs> they need to be pocket sized. I mean, the, it's, it's much better if you have a pocket sized device, not something you put on a table and have to plug in the mains. And a last point that I will address is that some formulations, these bi biological formulations, are really fragile. So I'm glad that uh, Chantal uh, Darken already explained this yesterday to you. Uh, this is uh, the blue cloud is different throat geometries for children, and the red one is for adults. And there's lots of spread. So people are so different that some people can inhale something and a lot will go to the lungs. And in other people, a lot of that will remain in the mouth and throat. And the most important there is that if you want to make a good nebulizer and a good inhalation system, you need to be at a low tronchio, uh, tracheobronchial loss. Because if you're in the middle, then there will be a lot of variation. So the, the middle of the graph is really wide. So if you have average okay-ish deposition, then a lot of the population will get nothing and some of the population will get a lot. And if you're more at the beginning of the graph, so let's say that you are at 10 or 15 or 20% losses in the mouth and throat, then the, the graph is much, much narrower there. So you, if you develop a new nebulizer or a new inhaler, you, you really have to make sure that you have very little uh, tracheobronchial uh, deposition. The other thing for biologics is that you, you need a pocket-sized device uh, that can do high volumes. And at the moment, if you're developing a biologic and you need milligrams instead of micrograms, then you don't have much choice. Then you can, you can use a, a jet nebulizer, you can use vibrating mesh nebulizers, and some of them have batteries, so they're smaller. Um, and th there are small devices that are metered the soft mist inhalers, like the Beringer uh, Respimat and the, the generics for that, but they do 15 microliters, which is a quite small dose per puff. So I would say that the, the innovation space in nebulizers would be to make pocket-sized devices that can deliver high doses. <laughs> Last point of my talk is about degradation of formulations. So the University of Amsterdam did research with the Moderna vaccine. The vaccine is not developed for inhalation. So it's a fragile lipid nanoparticle formulation with mRNA in it. But just as a model, they used this formulation and put it through different nebulizers. And uh, the reference is the, the stock solution. And it has a, a peak. And the peak is the size of the, of the uh, LNPs, the lipid nanoparticles. And what you see is that if you nebulize it with a respimat, which is quite fierceful, or with a, uh, a pari e flow, which has quite sharp edges, you break open a lot of these uh, lipid nanoparticles, and you see the, the actual size of the, um, so you see a, a new peak arising or a new plateau, that, that's the size of the mRNA itself or the, if you break the mRNA in fragments, it's the size of the fragments. And this, is, this really has to do with the, with the geometry. So if you look at the aerogen nebulizer that was used here, it has quite rounded uh, holes in the vibrating mesh. And the uh, Pari eFlow Rapid, which was used, has quite sharp holes. Um, and um, this makes a difference in how much you damage the formulation. Um, I have to say, I mean, I talked to the, to the guys in Pari because I, I didn't want to offend them with this, this presentation. And they, they indicated that they know this and that, for instance, for the Ericase product, which is a liposomal formulation of uh, Emicasin, the one with, uh, with Insmed, that they, that they tweaked the, their, their uh, membranes. So they can make some changes to make it more suitable for biologics, and they, also, they can also change the, 
the electronics in the device to be less fearful on, on these, uh, these kind of uh, formulations. So yeah, I hope I've given you uh, a nice overview of what nebulizers are and uh, what, what the innovation has been in the last five years and uh, my view on where the innovation should go in the, in the next five years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wilbur, a really fascinating talk. Uh, we've probably got time for maybe just one question um, before our next presenter. Does anybody, I can't see anybody. Please remember we have got Slido or obviously oh, okay, feel sorry. free to use a fixed or a roaming mic. Yeah. Oh, hello, I'm Cathy Oliver from um, from Ascent. Um, thank you very much for your, your talk today. I find it incredibly interesting. But one of the th comments you made towards the end was about protein degradation. And that's obviously going to be quite an issue if you're talking about that you want things to become um, either not being cleaned, as in just reused, without there being any cleaning in between. You're talking about reducing costs that way. And also, if you want to, um, you know, the, the, which molecules would actually be able to be used for this. Have you got any thoughts on that at all? For, for the device that lasts for a week or a month or so, exactly, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so, so there's several aspects there. So one is the, the microbial aspect. So if you have a very nutrition formulation and you don't put a lot of uh, um, uh, preservative in it, then bacteria might grow in and, and uh, that, that might not be acceptable. Um, so for instance, in the, in the recipe mat, which is used for a month, they have uh, benzalkonium chloride as a preservative in it. And they have a watery solution with a small molecule. And I think for, for long use, these type of molecules are, are, are suitable. They normally don't kind of block or occlude uh, the nozzles or the meshes. So you can use them from the same mesh for, for a longer time. I've seen lots of formulations, especially on the biologic side. And then also, for instance, it, insulin is very, very sugary and very sticky. And if you put that through a nozzle and you let it dry in, then it really plasticizes. So it, it kind of networks and it becomes a kind of plastic layer on the, on the membrane. And that ruins it completely. So you can use it one day, put it away overnight, and then it will, it will block. But there are tricks to, let's say, when you nebulize liquid, then afterwards you kind of shake the membrane for a while to kind of self-clean, that you, that you can use systems longer. But it, it, it's a good question, and it's something that's not resolved, and that's, that will need a lot more innovation in, in that area. Also, I was thinking about the, the, um, that through not all nebulizers, you will have some residual volume left post-nebulization. You don't actually deliver everything that you put into the, um, the cup. My, sorry, I can't think of the right words. And so as a result, if you aren't, even if you try to shake it off, there may still be some residual material in. And as, we, as those people who work with them, large molecules have an understanding that if there's some residual material left and not cleaned off properly, then that, that also can, that can then aggregate and then act as, as, act as a seed for aggregation for further dosing. And then obviously there's, you've got that issue with um, the immunological responses that you may, may get if you then deliver that to the patient. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. And, and I, the current nebulizers that are on the market are, are almost all requiring uh, cleaning. So you, you put in your medication for that treatment, you use it, and afterwards you flush it away, you rinse it, you have to clean it and sterilize it. But th there are some new systems coming which are using containers that are kind of married to their, to their aerosol generator. And, and apparently they are finding ways to, to do that. Uh, Thank you. Right. I'm, going to, yeah. uh, I'm going to wrap this up now because I'm keen that we, we've got a few other questions. But maybe Kathy, if you maybe suggest you um, touch base with Wilbur during the drinks and have that discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wilbur. Thank you. Thank you.